Okay. So um, I'll begin. Um, so thank you everyone for coming to tonight's event. My name is Riley and I'm the founding club president of the U Windsor Anthrozoology Club. Although we are not on our campus right now and many of you might be located elsewhere in the world, I would still like to acknowledge that the land on which the University of Windsor is located on is on traditional, traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of the First Nations comprised of the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi peoples. We are grateful to work, learn, and live in this area. Now, I know that many of you are aware of who our guest speaker is tonight, but I would still like to take the opportunity to formally introduce Dr. Mark Beckoff. Dr. Beckoff is a professor, um, professor emeritus of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Colorado Boulder. He has published 31 books, won many awards for his research on animal behavior, animal emotions, compassionate conservation and animal protection and has worked closely with Jane Goodall and is a former Guggenheim Fellow. He also works closely with inmates at the Boulder County Jail. Dr. Beckoff's latest books are The Animal's Agenda, Freedom, Compassion and Coexistence in the Human Age with Jessica Pierce, Canine Confidential, Why Dogs Do What They Do, and Unleashing Your Dog, A Field Guide to Giving Your Canine Companion the Best Life Possible, again with Jessica Pierce. And he also publishes regularly for Psychology Today. Dr. Beckoff and his colleague Jessica Pierce have a new book called A Dog's World, Imagining the Lives of Dogs in a World Without Humans that will be published by Princeton University Press in the fall of 2021. In 1986, Dr. Beckoff won the master's age graded Tour de France. His sure. webpage is, of course, markbeckoff.com. And I just wanted to go over some housekeeping rules tonight before we begin our Q&A session. Um, in the top right hand corner of the team screen, you will see a smiley face with a little hand up. Um, you can click that to raise your hand and you'll be put in the virtual queue to ask your question. We'll be able to see the ordered list of who has their hand raised and then I will call upon you once it's your turn if you want to raise your hand and speak. Um, we just politely ask that you keep your microphone on mute until you are ready to ask your question. Um, however, if you are uncomfortable with asking your question over the microphone, um, you're more than welcome to use the chat box feature as well and we'll record that. So without further ado, I guess we'll get started. Um, if anyone wants to go first or has a question that you'd like to ask Dr. Beckoff, we will get started. Okay, so it looks like Emily Tronetti. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Emily, if you'd like to ask your question, feel free. Yeah, great. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. So uh, Dr. Beckoff, I am a huge fan of your work and I have been for a very long time. Um, I am currently pursuing my doctor of education in humane education and um, I'm also an animal trainer. And I've really appreciated your perspective on um, like dog training and dog welfare. And I mean, gosh, you write about so many um, of the issues that we're kind of faced with in our relationships with other animals. And I'm particularly curious um, what your thoughts are on the best way to, to educate and, and inspire kind of the general public to have you know, better relationships with other animals? Um, I know it's kind of a big question, but do you have like in your experience um, or in your research, you know, nailed down any like specific strategies for, um, you know, for reaching the public? Um, yeah, that's kind of my question, I guess. <laughs> oh, Dr. Beckoff, I believe your microphone is on mute. Okay, now is it unmuted? No. Is, now can you hear me? You're all good. There's this um, there's this banner that comes across with all these things in it. <laughs> it had my microphone muted. Um, so that's a great question. I think <coughs> humane humane education broadly 
um, viewed, I think, is the way to do it and, and setting an example for others. Um, and and I, I, mean, I think the real changes are, are going to come from the masses, if you will. I mean, I think academics makes a contribution and an important contribution, but I think getting the word out to um, newspapers, magazines, TV stations, radio shows, um, and also just having talks like this uh, are really, um, really functional um, and getting the information out because no matter how many people are here now, we're, we're a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of people in the world who even know about or care about animal well-being. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but I, but I do think that, um, I mean, I, I like to sit back and go, wow, everybody, everybody wants to care for non-human animals and everybody is going to know all the details. They don't. And I, that's not a criticism, but, but they don't. Um, so I think putting the information out there and, and education is key. And to me, the bottom line is education, education, education. Um, and also putting out positive messages about um, the good things that are happening, because there are good things happening amongst all the bad things that are happening, but also instilling hope in people. I think that that's really important because why you're not going to get people to work on certain issues if you don't um, give them hope. I mean, you, you're just not going to. So that's my thumbnail sketch of at least four books. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, our next question comes from Emily. Uh, she is a executive member from the Anthrozoology Club. Emily? I can't hear you. Emily, your microphone. Oh my gosh, every time. Okay, so hello again. Um, so to follow up on your answer there, um, obviously I'm sure you've dealt with a lot of people who uh, still don't believe in what you're um what you're preaching basically um that you know animals don't have sentience and everything like that and, and a lot of people are very behind on that um how do you deal with that from an education perspective and in talking to people um do you ever just get so angry or like what is your coping mechanism because that's something I'm struggling with right now when people talk to me about animals who are not on the same page as me and how do you how do you deal with that and and how are you able to how have you been able to do this your whole life yeah I mean that's a good question because a lot of it centers on um ideas about burnout you know you just get to the point where you just go to hell with it um and I've got better things to do um, I don't get angry with them. I, I really believe that the only thing you can do is show them what we know and move on. And because they're going to make up their own minds. But, but what I often do is ask people if they live with a dog. So it could be a cat or another companion animal. And when they say yes, you know, I, I might say something. Well, do you think your dog likes to play? Uh-huh. You, you know, does your dog suffer from separation anxiety? Uh-huh. Does your dog get jealous or feel guilty or, you know, just run through the whole panoply of emotions? And after they answer yes, and you hope they answer yes, because I always I always feel that if they answered no, I always say, I'm glad I'm not your dog. Um, but if they answer yes, then so well, wh well, what about other animals? Maybe starting with mammals, you know, just animals who are close to, say, mammalian um, uh, companion animals and then just talk to them. You know, I just really, I just don't, I just don't see how there's any way to get through to people by trying to embarrass them or shame them or make them feel guilty for the things that they do or don't do. Um, and there's plenty of information out there now, but, I, but I'd always say I like bringing it home, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in the sense of asking them if they live with a companion animal or a dog. And then if, and, and I mean, I, I really don't remember talking to somebody who said, no, I don't think my dog has emotions. I mean, you hope they don't, but, but I really mean that. And then using that as an example and saying, well, they're mammals and they have the same brains as, 
you know, wolves and other animals, bears, other mammals, mice, rats, you know, laboratory animals, um, large animals who you see in zoos like elephants. And I find that that works, but getting angry with them, just, it doesn't work. It just, in the end, you sort of maybe win the battle, but you lose the war because you're not going to be able to convince them otherwise. Um, I also think that part of putting the message out for really long times is just not burning out on it, taking a break, you know, take care of yourself. Um, the, the other entry, uh, let me just say this because I know there's other questions, is um, I point them to the One Health movement that from conservation psychology that clearly shows that caring for non-humans um, helps people care for humans. I, I mean, and, and some of them go, oh, that's a lot of blow. I don't know. No, I just say, you know, go read about it, you know. Um, and I think the pandemic that's happening all over shows that really clearly because so many people are saying that they feel much more compassion to non-humans when they care about humans and vice versa, by the way. So the so when people say to me, how can you work on non-humans when there's so many humans suffering? I always say, because it's all related. That's true, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Liz, did you have your hand up? I did, I worry that my question might be kind of similar, but I guess I'll ask it anyway. Um, I, I'm a student in the anthrozoology uh, certificate program. Um, in our animal ethics class, we had to read the uh, moral in tooth and claw, and you touch upon the right and wrong ways of behaving, depending on the situation. And I'm kind of thinking of that in a human perspective. When I speak to others about animal rights or animal sentience, and I'm sure many of us in this group have also seen the same, automatically there are these walls up and people kind of have a very interesting way of behaving, uh, what I might perceive to be a wrong way, which is to just put balls up and be reluctant to talk about it at all. So for the human rules of engagement, do you have any suggestions on how to engage in a conversation and how to approach the topics of animal morality with others? Yeah, and I, I should have memorized them, but to be honest with you, I haven't. So, so yeah, in my book, Rewilding Our Hearts, I laid out what I call the eight P's of, I guess you could look at it, the eight P's of activism, being polite, um, being proactive, being patient. Um, it's morphed into 12 P's. Um, and I, I, if I, if I thought I would keep the screen and I'd go to my email and fish them out because I don't remember them, but you can look them up. Um, but being polite, being proactive, being proud of what you're doing, being patient, and um, and never um, putting them on the defensive, never. I mean, once someone's on the defensive, you might as well just go home. You know, they might just say, "Yeah, you're right," and leave. But you, but you really haven't made any impact. Um, and just putting out the information. I, I, I really, really, I really, really um, believe that that works. Because a lot of people who fight ideas about animal protection, animal well-being, animal rights, whatever you want to call it, um, and also ignore what we know from evolutionary biology uh, research and, and just pure common sense. Just, I'm sorry, that common sense plays a role in here. Um, there's enough out there to um, for them to look at that could change their minds. but. I just talk with them. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, maybe years ago, I might have had a much more, um, <laughs> I might have been a little more short tempered. Um, it doesn't work. I mean, I do a lot of work with Jane Goodall, and she's very good at sort of just talking with people. And then, you know, you know, in a sense, just saying, okay, well, I, I've said all I can say. I mean, you're either going to think about it or you're not. Um, so I don't know if that helps, but. It, but it's a really good question because I don't think that people who care about animals the way we do need to be self-righteous. I mean, I, I think the way we all care about animals grants us a lot of self-righteousness, but it doesn't work when you're dealing with people who are truly asking questions or, or who just want to irritate you. 
I mean, there's people out there who just want to waste your time. So the other thing I always say is just pick your battles. And I don't like the word battles, but but pick your battles, you know. And sometimes it's perfectly okay to say, fine, we dis- we agree to disagree. I'm moving on. Um, because a lot of people um, who get into these kinds of arguments, they live off of conflict. I'm sure you know people in other venues who they live off of conflict. And I have no interest to give them the energy or energize them, you know. Um, so and sometimes you just have to give up because I'd rather talk to people who are open to listening than people who just you can tell that they're just really pushing your buttons. I don't know. And that gets back to burnout. I'm getting so many emails from younger people like you who are burning out on it. And I'm thinking, geez, (laughs) that's the worst news of the day because we need you. So part of not burning out really means picking the people with whom you're going to talk and accepting that you're not going to change everybody. But it's not a defeatist attitude. It's a realistic attitude. It's just saying, OK, I put it out there. I need to talk to people who are really open to changing, um, just like I might be. So these are, these are great questions. There's a lot of theses and um, magazine articles there for you all to write. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Liz. That was a great question. Um, does anyone else have a question that they'd like to ask Dr. Beckoff? Oh, I see that Shelly just raised their hand. Shelly, if you'd like to speak. Uh, yeah, I'm actually, I have a question and I'm not gonna turn on my camera because frankly, I've been on uh, video calls all day. <laughs> um, but from a, a faculty perspective, what are some suggestions you have for individuals who may be attempting to start, create, build something like an anthrozoology certificate or minor, um, you know, ways of of getting this engaged on the education level. I do a lot of this work with my lab and within my classes, uh, but there's only so far that I can I can really push it without having the you know the internal institutional structures behind it. Who, who is this, Shelley? Who? Shelley Volsh. Oh, okay. I, I know some Shelleys in Canada. Um, oh, no, I'm in Boise. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, that's a great question. I mean, one thing I used to do when I taught here at CU was just tell them that it's the most popular topic in the world. It is. I mean, I mean, it is. You know, I mean, all the people studying, I was in a biology department, so people doing microbiology and ecology and conservation biology, I mean, they're doing important work too. But, I mean, there's nothing more popular across the world than, if you will, the general category of anthrozoology, conservation psychology, conservation behavior, compassionate conservation. I mean, there's huge number of people interested and there's a huge cohort of, if you will, younger people, students, grad students, young faculty who really are interested in this. So just tell them that, you know, this is really important. Um, I think one obstacle that you might run into, I don't know if you will, but is that people will say, well, it's not really science. Um, I have heard that occasionally. (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, I've heard it too. And I mean, I, you know, I I don't, I can't tell you what I really want to say to these people, but, but I usually just say, well, of course it's science. I mean, just do a, just do a web search for anthrozoology, conservation, psychology, um, compassion, behavior, um, sorry, conservation behavior, human animal studies. I mean, just do web searches. They, it's huge. Animal law programs are just coming up all over the world now. And there's global interests. And once again, I think that the there's no, I mean, in all honesty, there's no bright side to the pandemic. But if you wanted to look to see a bright light from it, and that is People are meeting animals they never met before who come into town. They have new neighbors um, and and they will really want to learn more about the lives of these animals. And um, I I mean, that's that's just my take on it. Um, but but in a biology department, I used to get, you know, grief about um, 
well, it's not really science. And then, of course, of course, when people say that, it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Um, and when we started a non-dissection lab, I started it with a woman who's a grad student. My colleagues were very dismissive and they said, well, yeah, you can do it. Nobody will take it. It, it filled up faster than any of the other lab. I mean, it, just, it really did. We had to add sections to it. And that, of course, pissed them off. Um, but, but that's too bad because the students should have a voice. So right. I think that I think that's the tact I would take. And, and, you know, I mean, the data, the data are there. I mean, whenever I go online and I look for anthrozoology programs or, you know, conservation psych or other programs, there's a zillion hits now. Um, and a lot of law schools are now having animal law programs. So that's what I would do. And, and don't give up. Don't let them, don't let them push you around. Um, if you're a student faculty, sometimes like to push you around. Don't, don't, don't let them push you around. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Great. So um, our next question is from Gretchen. Gretchen, if you'd like to ask your question. Hello. Hello. Uh, so I am currently a conservation biology graduate student right now. Um, and I was just really hoping to get kind of your opinion or your suggestions on maybe the most effective avenues I can take within the conservation biology field to really promote animal welfare and compassionate conversation, uh, com compassionate con conservation yeah. and concern for individuals. I'm finding, you know, in the traditional conservation biology, my values differ pretty significantly from some of the more traditional approaches. Um, and I'm really wanting to be able to use what I'm learning right now to advocate for animal welfare. Do you do you have any suggestions for current conservation biology students or biology students in general about how to channel what we're learning and what you know research we have and what credentials we'll have in order to best advocate for compassionate conversation? Conservation that's, that's, yeah, that's that's a great question. I mean, I think. I mean, cutting through the chase, a lot of traditional conservation is just kill. I mean, that's what it is. Trade off one species of owl for another, you know, kill some birds, cormorants to save salmon. Um, kill in the name of coexistence, which is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I mean, like in the United States, wildlife services. I mean, even defenders of wildlife in the United States supports killing when it has to be done. I mean, they, they just do. Um, and, and so I think that um, showing from a, from a sort of a data point of view, showing that a lot of traditional conservation um, protocols just don't work. I mean, it, they work in the short run. It's like beating a dog to get them to do something. You can get them to do something, but in the long run, it doesn't work. So I think looking at the successes of, of um, say, for example, compassion and conservation, and that relates to, I think it was Shelley's question, you know, about different programs. I mean, what I love about Compassion and Conservation is that it entails or it brings in people from biology, psychology, sociology, anthropology, law, political science, human, you know, animal studies, philosophy. I mean, I'm, I know I'm sociology and every, it's almost any discipline you could pull people in, human animal studies. So I, what I love about it is, is how interdisciplinary it is. But what I love about it, too, is how um, there are so many successes to it. Some, I mean, some of the recent papers I've been a co-author on, we you know, show people the successes. The other thing, and I'm just reading a book now, it's very interesting. It's called, um, I don't know if you can see, it's called Beloved, um, Fighting, the, Fighting for Life, in an age of ex extinction called Beloved Beasts. And it's a paper we just published. And there were um, five women, I think four or five women who were co-authors on it, is that um, traditional conservation is really man-driven, man if you will. And it's very capitalistic. And and, and once again, people can go, oh, you know, you're just saying that you're a hippie, you live in Colorado, blah, 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 blah. No, that's not it at all. It really is. And so one of the things that I really like about the compassion of conservation movement is that there are, there's a whole lot of women who are really, really 
talented, skilled, and interested who are bringing in what one of my colleagues used to used to call, um, in a very demeaning way, the soft side. And we published, we have a paper out called The Importance of Emotion in Conservation that focuses on um, compassion and focus, um, conservation. But the challenges that come, like compassion and conservation is against um, maintaining or increasing bio biodiversity. That's not true at all. Um, or that it's it's compassion and soft and emotion driven. Well, it is compassion and emotion driven, but it's not soft. Um, another is that it's elitist. I mean, most of the criticisms of, that have been published of uh, compassion and conservation strongly show that the people don't read what we write. There's, there's really an inborn, almost innate, inherent um, resistance to the notions of compassion and emotion in science in general and in conservation um, specifically. Um, but I just show them the successes and there's a lot. You know, the fact, you know, when people say it's elitist, I mean, some of the best projects that have been done have been done in East Africa, in India, in, you know, countries that are hardly elitist, <laughs> if you will. I mean, the, the, there might be elitist people in the countries, but I mean, it's not a Western, you know, driven um, discipline. Um, and, and I don't know what your experience is, but my experience over the last maybe five or six years is that more and more, um, say, undergrads and grad students and, and uh, if you will, newer, younger researchers and maybe uh, professors um, are keenly interested in compassionate conservation because I always, they always say, well, the critics say, well, I, I don't really want to kill these animals, but, and my response is, don't harm them, don't kill them. I mean, it's really simple. You know, I don't want to, I really don't want to kill you, but I'm thinking, sorry, I don't really want to hear that. <laughs> um, but I think looking at the successes and the fact that it's strongly um, driven by data. I mean, it's driven by heart, but it's strongly driven, driven by data. And then when people um, I wrote an essay a few years ago about the different um, mission statements for different organizations. So, for example, um, Project Coyote in the United States, that's one of them. Predator Defense in the U.S., a whole lot of organizations in India strive for coexistence and not killing. But others say that they will not exclude, they won't take killing off the um, menu of options, but they work for coexistence. I, I don't, I don't get it. If someone said, I want to coexist with you, but I need to kill you. I think I'd say, well, you know, I've, I've got something else to do tonight. Um, so I don't know if that helped you, but in the science department, there could be resistance, but I just think putting out the facts is really important. Um, oh, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate and it. And ask you people about what success means. Oh, some of my colleagues just back off when they when they hear that. Well, what do you mean this project was successful? You know, you went out and killed a thousand of this species to save a thousand of the other or hundreds of the others, and it was successful. But but what do you mean by success? People don't like to answer that question. I've learned over the years. They'll go, well, you know what I mean? And I'm going, well, no, I don't know what you mean. I mean, tell me what you mean by success. Do it in a nice way. <laughs> That's what, and and treating these people nicely is very disarming to them. It it it, it really is because a lot of them are looking for battles. So I hope that helps you along a bit. Oh, it does. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for that. Our next question is from Carmen. Carmen, if you'd like to speak, by all means. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, I am a PhD student from Mexico, and I am working uh, uh, on bioethics about the contribution that we can get from Buddhism into conservation biology. Uh, but I found a, I have found a lot of antagonism to the idea of adding some religious thought into conservation biology. Uh, 
I, and when I read your work about compassionate conservation, I, I really loved it because Buddhism is all about compassion. So I was wondering what are your thoughts about the addition of some religious thought into conservation biology? I think it's great. And um, one of the best people in the world doing this, it's a husband wife team, but a woman named Mary Evelyn Tucker, she's at Yale University. And you can email me and I can give you her email address so you could find her on the web and tell her you talked with me, which we're talking, and, um, and say I recommended. Mary Evelyn would be outstanding. She's edited many books on Taoism, Confucianism, Buddhism, um, on, and, and um, animal behavior, animal relationships. And Paul Waldau, W-A-L-D-A-U, um, he ran the anthrozoology program at Canisius College in Buffalo, New York, or somewhere near Buffalo. Maybe it's in Buffalo um, for a long time. But those would be two people. I mean, I think it's a really good way to look, I think, uh, to go. I think looking at religious and cultural and spiritual contributions to, um, say, in this case, conservation projects is really enlightening. Um, I support you 100%. I think within the Buddhism community, you'll find that there's some really, there's some distinctly different dif differences. I mean, I was, was in China once and I was sitting down and I naively was thinking that, well, you know, the stuff I've read, you know, Buddhism, nonviolence, um, it's not totally, totally like that. And I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, but, but there, was, there was some heated discussion around the dinner table a lot of it in Chinese, which thank goodness I didn't understand, <laughs> but, um, but I think it's really important. And I think it's an important way to get to a huge number of people, for example, like in the United States, it's, I mean, I think there might be more right wing Republicans who are, or fewer white, white as well, but white right wing Republicans who fight animal protection, animal rights, animal well-being type of legislation. But it's not necessarily the case that it's a left-right issue. And I don't think it's necessarily the case that you're going to find distinct, I'm not sure how to say this, but distinct lines um, among, or, or within and among different religions. But it's, it's a great way to do it. I, I was thrilled when I used to be asked to give lectures in churches of different denominations or synagogues. I mean, I'm not, I'm pretty much an atheist, to be honest with you, but, but I love the fact that they wanted me to talk. And I would tell them before, this is what I'm going to talk about. Okay. And they were open to it. So I think the project that you're working on is really, really important. And thank you for joining. And, and I just gave a talk or did a similar Q and A with a bunch of um, animal law students in Santiago, Chile. Um, and and there's, there's a number of really um, active groups throughout South America, in, in every country in South America. But, but I, love, I love what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Super interesting. Thank you for asking that question. Yeah. Um, our next one is from Jillian. Jillian, if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I'm currently an undergrad student. I'm graduating in May and exploring different options uh, for a career in animal behavior, whether that be through graduate programs or um, job opportunities. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any advice as I'm exploring this world. Of course, there's so much variety and paths I could take, um, which can be overwhelming. So any suggestions? <laughs> Where were you in undergrad? I'm at Penn State University. Okay. No, that's a great question. I get emails like that all the time. And the first thing I do is tell the people we need to talk because I, I write short emails. I don't capitalize. I don't punctuate. And then the same with texting. If more than two, and I'll say, let's just talk. Um, well, there's lots of opportunities. I mean, there's academic opportunities, grad school. There's a lot of programs now. So, for example, in conservation psychology, depending, uh, did you say, what are you majoring in, did you say? Um, I'm studying community development, international agriculture, and anthropology. That's wonderful, because agriculture 
is an incredibly huge area. I mean, people will argue that people who have the right attitude, which we have, um, because we're allowed to say that among ourselves, um, but the amount of damage to ecosystems and non-human animals' lives is the largest it is in agriculture. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. Um, so I think that's really good. There's a woman, I don't know if she's still doing it, but I could certainly find out. Um, years ago, she was working in um, South Africa or East Africa. I'm not sure, South Africa, working on agricultural programs and animal and conservation issues. Um, I know people might disagree with me, but um, I'm all for people taking some time, um, even after high school, but after college, to try to find their niche. Um, um, I, a friend of mine's daughter has, was just admitted to a grad program in animal behavior, but she's taking a year off and they admitted her. I understand that programs differ on that. Some will say, you've been accepted this year, you come, and if you don't, you reapply. Um, but once again, I mean, it's not that I'm against graduate school in any sense of the word, but, you know, depending on what you want to do, there might be ways to get a lot of experience and then go back to school. There's programs online that you can use. One of my friends went back years after undergrad, um, after, grad, after getting her undergraduate degree and did a really nice online degree in conservation after getting her hands wet and being out there. Um, on the other hand, I mean, I think we need all the compassionate academics we can find because we're few and far between. I mean, we're, we're a good club for talking to one another and going rah-rah and preaching to the converted, but, but I think that, um, I think it's huge to get people into academics who are who are compassionate, not only about non-humans, but humans. I mean, because that's one of, to, to me, that's one of the real selling points of compassionate conservation is, once again, all stakeholders matter. So, the, I mean, some of the work I've done in East Africa and in um, Southern India, I mean, the humans count. Compassionate conservation people aren't saying humans don't count. They count. So you have to balance what's going on with the well-being and, the, and their lives as well as the non-human animals. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, there's so many different um, opportunities now for, I mean, maybe because of the pandemic too, but in terms of being able to educate yourself remotely and getting your hands wet. I think getting out there is important. I, I, I really do. Um, I don't know if that helps you along, um, but, but you're entering a field, I mean, you, the general interests that are, they're huge, glo globally. You won't have, you know, with the right background and, and a little bit of luck, there's luck as well, um, you won't have any trouble probably finding some work anywhere you want to live. And I, I really mean that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, our next question is from Holly. Holly, if you'd like to ask. Hi there. Um, I'm currently um, just an undergrad student working on my biology degree, and I'm also taking Dr. Daly's um, anthrozoology certificate while I'm at school. Um, and my question is about conservation. Um, a lot of zoos, like the San Diego Zoo and the Bronx Zoo, say that they are helping conservation efforts by initiating breeding programs for species who are on the vulnerable and endangered species list. However, they don't release these animals back into the wild. So I'm, I'm wondering how you feel that they are helping conservation efforts with programs like this. And if you don't believe that they are, uh, what do you think the zoos could be doing to actually help with um, you know, bio, biodiversity conservation? Mm -hmm. Well, my attitude about zoos is it's relatively narrow. There are good and there are better and worse zoos, but I don't think a lot of the quote better or good zoos are, are good enough. Um, so I'm really open to zoo reform. Um, I'm against captive breeding. I, I just, 
what you're doing is you're basically re- you're, you're right about animals being reintroduced. I mean, I've been down that road too many times. Um, and um, so I'm against captive breeding and I'm really a fan of major zoo reform. Um, a lot of people will say that zoos make zero contribution to conservation efforts, and that's wrong. I mean, they, they make some contributions depending on the project, for example. Um, so I think they should be putting their money and their efforts into retaining, if you will, retaining and acquiring wild habitat where these animals live. Um, because a lot of money goes into captive breeding and captive breeding is brutal. I mean, I, 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 I think especially for the females who get shipped around, I mean, they're the, they are the gender who are carrying and, you know, and, and you hope if you, if you will, you hope that if they give birth, that they'll have some time with their young, but they don't. I mean, like the, the Denver zoo here just rips polar bear babies away from mom puts them on display and makes a lot of money, separates them and ships them across the world, if you will. So, um, so to me, captive breeding is brutally inhumane. And, and once again, what it does is it looks at the well-being of species, if you will, not individuals. And that's where compassion and conservation comes in. Um, yeah, you can make more polar bears and you can put them on display there's no evidence at all that that helps polar bears in the wild. I mean, there's zero evidence, you know. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but but you know, like the Bronx Zoo and the Wildlife Society, out of you know, I know a lot of people who work for them. I mean, they do quote good things for conservation in different areas of the world, but captive breeding in my in my eyes should be shut down. Yesterday, it just should be shut down. It's brutally inhumane. Um, and, 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 and it's, it's a lie. It's just a blatant lie to say these animals will be reintroduced to the wild. You know, there's only been a handful of success. There's been a handful of projects and fewer successes. Um, re- reintroduction problems, and I've worked on them, some of them, projects are really hard to pull off. So I, so I encourage my, well, I don't teach now, but I encourage my students and I encourage people with whom I write, uh, with whom I correspond, um, to suggest alternatives to them. And one, of course, would be to focus on maintaining and developing wild populations of animals, taking that money t- and turning, I mean, basically turning zoos into rehab centers and taking in animals who, um, who need help, if you will, but not making more animals who are going to live in jail cells. So that's just the bottom line for me. That's just stop it. The other result of this is what I call zoothanasia, is zoos get too many animals and they kill them. They kill otherwise healthy animals. And while it doesn't occur that much in the U.S. and Canada, to the best of my knowledge, zoos in Europe are still killing thousands of animals a year who are otherwise healthy. I mean, they, ju- they just really are. The Europeans... Association of Zoos, I'm not quite sure what it's called, they kill thousands of animals a year. And of course, Marius the giraffe in the Copenhagen Zoo was kind of the poster corpse, if you will, for these efforts. You know, they killed a young giraffe, otherwise healthy, because he couldn't contribute to the gene pool and diversity of captive giraffes. And they bragged about it. I mean, sorry, but to me, that was one of the sickest things I've ever read about in my life. So I'll stop there, but I hope I made my point um, to you. And and if not, you can tell me whether I did or not. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. That certainly puts it into a different perspective. Thank you. You betcha. Yeah, you always say, how would you like to be shipped around the world to make babies? (laughs) I mean, mean, sorry, that's what what they're doing. And then they're ripping the babies away. I mean, not not particularly inviting. Great. Yeah. Um, our next question comes from Evelyn. If I'm pronouncing your name wrong, I'm sorry, but uh, feel free to go ask your question. Okay. Um, I'm from Brazil and I'm a bit, ne- bit nervous. I hope you can understand my accent. You're doing I'm, 
I'm a journalist teacher and a contemporary culture researcher. And I just finished my thesis and your work was a, a great source of information and inspiration. I taught sociology to vet students here in Brazil and I wish you could see the impact of your books on them, how we change their approach to the profession. Perfect. Right now, I'm studying the relationships between human and non-human animals in the media. And I would like to know your opinion about the, the role of the press in this, this huge work of making people think about animal feelings, consciousness. Are we journalists doing a good work when we speak about animal rights? That's a great question. It relates to what I was saying before about getting the information out to um, radio stations, newspapers, magazines, and other popular media. Um, some places are doing really well. Other places are doing horribly. They really are. I mean, the New York, some of the New York Times articles on animals are just the worst I've ever read in my life. And it's not only containing misinformation, but they refer to animals as witches and that's and it's rather than hims, hers, his, 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 I don't know, his, her, hims, hers. I don't even know what the words are, but rather like gender neutral. Uh, and, and, um, and animals aren't objects. And, and what I have found, and I might be, you know, um, I don't think that I've got um, biased sources, but I think the media is changing a lot. They, they really are, and I think that it, they're changing for the good. But that's one of my peeves, if you will, is the way in which media represents animals. I mean, so I studied dogs, I've studied wolves, I've studied coyotes, I've studied penguins, and I read all these articles about dogs do this or dogs don't do this, and I'm going, uh-uh, that's not true. So another, I think, real important message in mass media is to stress individuality and individual differences, for example, um, and referring to animals by name, not number, not it's, that's, or witches. And slowly but surely, I mean, really things are, and, and animals are who or whom, the, the female baboon Marie who did something. And I just edited something and I just changed. I just, I, it was a Word document for somebody and I just changed every that to who. And of course there were places where that would have been appropriate. And he said to me, well, what'd you do? And I said, I changed every that to who. Now you can go back and put the facts in that should be there. But if you use Word or Microsoft, you will get a notice and it will underline it. And they'll want to change who to not, when you're referring to a non-human animal, to that or to which or to it. But your question is really important. Media is critical. And all sorts, not only magazines and newspapers, but radio, TV, um, documentaries, for example. And recently I had to, I, I mean, I didn't mean it as an arrogant threat. I just said they were changing some of my wording and then they were going to make a video of it. I said, you can't do it. You just can't do it. That, that, that um, wolf over there is a female. It's she. That wolf over there is a male. It's a he. And she has a name. Um, naming animals is critical. You know, you know, lab people like to number animals. But do you number your dog? <laughs> I mean, you name them because giving a name preaching to the converted with all you anthrozoologists, you give a name to an animal and you've got a, an identity of, you've got the identity of the animal and you've got a relationship. You know, you don't go, yeah, I'm going to get a beer with B42 and A18 or something like that. I mean, I'm being facetious, but serious, you know? Um, so your, your, your question is huge. And, th and that's why before half an hour ago, I think in popular media, um, of all sorts is one of the most important ways of representing animals. And um, there's a program of Kerry Peterson. I, 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 you know, you don't remember names anymore because you just sort of write them. But there's a woman at Georgia State University um, who has written a lot about this. 
Um, and there's a woman named Deborah Merskin in Oregon who's written a lot about the way in which animals are misrepresented in media. So thank you for your question, it's huge. I can't hear you. You're on mute, Riley. Oh, okay. oh, there we go. It kept getting stuck, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, our next question comes from one of our members in the Anthrozoology Club, Tammy. Tammy, if you'd like to raise your question. Hi, um, I'm a mature student. Um, I have previously have a work history of being a veterinary technician. Um, I've also worked at the Humane Society as an animal control officer and adoptions counselor. But my biggest barrier to working in a vet hospital and why part of the reason I had to get out was that lack of acknowledgement from a lot of especially, I hate to say it, but male veterinarians of being able to, <laughs> being able to put themselves in that pet's place and rough handling them and then getting mad at us because we're not rough handling them to get it yeah. done in five seconds as opposed to one minute. And yet that's our job. So I'm wondering if you have... I hate to sit, I hate to kind of summarize it, but any kind of quick way to kind of or or quick suggestions to start to kind of get the message through to people like that that this is a being we're working on. This is something that is feeling how I'm holding her and feeling the energy that you're approaching her with. And if you would just calm down, perhaps we could get this done faster. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get I mean, thanks for your question. I get numerous inquiries about that. Um Jessica Pierce, one of my colleagues, has written about that um, extensively. And I don't like generalities, but I do feel that um, there have been, there's been research, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's been research of vet students who actually come out of vet school less compassionate, you know, questioning the emotional lives of animals. Part of it, I think, and I know a lot of vets around here, and I know a lot of vets around the world who are in a con distinctly different category. Like the vet veterinarians who work at Animals Asia, where I do work in China. Um, not all women, but mostly women have the biggest hearts. Um, I think a lot of it's functional and a lot of it's financial. Got to get these animals in and out. You just can't, you can't piddle around petting a dog and saying, oh, you're such a nice dog and I feel for you and all that. And I don't mean that facetiously. I, I really mean that. I think a lot of it is, you know, we all know doctors like that, you, you know, doctors who care for humans. I mean, I know some people who are doctors who I wouldn't go to if I were dead. I mean, I, I mean, really, I mean, it's just insane the way they view you. Um, but that is a problem with it in the veterinary um, profession. It, it really is. And a lot. I mean, maybe you know this because I don't know this literature, but I know Jessica and I talk a lot. And that is a problem. Um, I think once again, it gets back to the earlier questions about just putting the information out there. You've got a sentient being there who cares about themselves and they care about others, but at the time they care about themselves. They care that they're in pain. They care that they're suffering. They care that they're stressed, living in fear and anxious. And so do we when we get in certain medical situations, if you will. Um, and I don't have an answer because I've talked to some veterinarians uh, who, I, who I don't really know. And some of the things they've said have just really warned me about, although they don't live in Boulder, that I wouldn't take my, I, I, like I, I, I wouldn't take my, a dead animal to them because they're so uncompassionate. So I, I understand what you're saying. I think it is a gender thing. I think there's a reason why so many females go into um, into veterinary medicine, and that's global too. Um, I I don't I can't say much more on that just just because I do know a lot of compassionate men, but but it is a problem, and I think a lot of you know one of the you know veterinary medicine has an incredibly high suicide rate. And I think a lot of it comes from the stress of the job. Um, a lot of it comes, I don't know what it's like in Canada, but when veterinarians on average get out of vet school in the United States, they're in debt beyond belief. They don't get fellowships. There's, there's no scholarships and stuff. So 
I'm not using that as an apology or an excuse, but at some point they are looking at non-human animals and maybe human animals as basically biological machines. Um, I have a lot of surgeon friends, uh, men and women, and thank goodness they don't. I mean, they're functionally, we are, we're just biological machines. A lot of chemicals put together and you can go in and fix a leg or a heart or a lung or a brain, but they understand that there's a human being behind this. And I think veterinarians need to understand that there's a sentient being who's involved in their decision-making and handling. And the rough handling is, is tantamount to like Caesar Milan dog training. You, you just, you're just taking a being who's anxious and stressed and you're just adding to you're adding to their anxiety and stress. And and I know enough biology to know that that could interfere with healing. OK, a stressed dog is going to heal differently and probably slower, if at all, than a dog who feels comfortable and safe and living in peace. So I, I, I don't know what more to say. I mean, the, the veterinarians who I know and to whom I've brought my animals are, are marshmallows. I love it. I, 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 I do. And, and they, it's been, you know, once again, I, I think it's, it may be just as a matter of um, just availability. It's been mostly women, but I, I know some men, men vets who melt and, and actually find it really hard to do their job because they're being pushed so hard to do things that they do not they do not want to do to animals in need. So I don't know if that helps you, but I, you're, you're, you're not alone in this. Believe me, I know a few people who have dropped out of vet school because they just, they just couldn't take it anymore. And they would love to help animals, but, but they found other ways to help animals. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate the answer. I mean, I even had a vet acknowledge my quote voodoo magic mind meld to make a pet calm down and he still wouldn't just do it himself. So thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I like to sometimes ask that question. Would you do it to you? Would you do it to a dog, your dog? And sometimes I shudder to <laughs> after asking it because I really don't want to know the answer. Yeah. So th thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I know that there is a message in the chat and that we have um, Andrea, Mathilde, and Adrian that have their hands up, but unfortunately we are out of time. I, I, I have a few more minutes if you want it. Okay, uh, we'll, do, we'll do the one in the chat. That was the next one on the list. Um, okay. The person says that their microphone isn't working, so that's why they're posting it in here. They say, hi, my name is Macy, and I'm in a doctoral program focusing on humane education. Dr. Beckoff, I'm curious about your perspective on why speciesism tends to be excluded from conservation uh, conversations around social justice and other forms of oppression. Thank you. That's a great question. It's because it's easy. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, I mean, it's it's just easy. You know, a lot of people just, I, if I'm reading the question right, a lot of people just feel very comfortable making these hierarchies of animals. I was just talking with somebody a few days ago. Um, I used the word blind drawing and they didn't know what it meant. And I was using it with refer with reference to speciesism where you make a slippery slope. And when I say we, I don't mean we, but you know, the raw we, humans put themselves on top. And on top means separate from and better than. And then that leads directly into speciesistic talk. It, it, it just does. You know, there's no higher or lower animals. You know, biologists will sometimes talk about that. And I mean, this is not new for me, but I mean, I would always say, well, what do you mean by a higher animal? I mean, you know, oh, well, they never can answer the damn question with anything. Um, you know, reliability. It's, oh, you know what I mean? No, I don't think a chimpanzee is higher than a mouse. I mean, mice have emotions and they have mouse emotions. Chimpanzees have chimpanzees emotion, chimpanzee emotions. But I think that it enters because it's easy to do and it sells, if you will. And people get a little very nervous. Um, I was talking to this woman um, and she, well, she's not a biologist, 
and she, you know she was talking about reptiles and amphibians and there's and fishes for example i mean there's a huge literature now on the cognitive and emotional lives of fishes and reptiles and amphibians and some insects and stuff so it's really easy to do but um spe species speciesistic speciesistic thinking is really the enemy of social justice and equality it, it just really is so I, I'm not I'm not sure if I'm answering the question that was asked but it's rampant it still is rampant and then of course it spills over into human exceptionalism you know we we deal the cards so we can deal any hand that we want um, and stuff and I always tell people keep you keep the door open because at least once a week I get a paper that it doesn't surprise me but it surprises a lot of people I get a paper that talks about the emotional lives of fishes the emotional lives of reptiles and amphibians and sentience you know people go well they're not con they're not sentient and I'm going really then why are people writing welfare laws to take care of reptiles and amphibians and insects and, and you know and snakes and other you know other animals who people would call lower you know if they weren't then and in the united states some of you might know when the federal animal welfare act was revised lab mice and rats and fishes and birds were deemed to be not animals and the word animals was redefined to exclude these animals and it is in today's federal animal welfare act and I've written a lot about it and people get really pissed off at me when I write about it because I'll say, well, you're a scientist, are rats, are rats animals? And they look at you like you're a moron and I'll go, they'll go, uh-huh. And I'll say, well, you know, the Animal Welfare Act says they're not. And they'll go, they'll either go, oh, I didn't know that, which is probably true because, you know, so many of them don't read anything that they don't want to read. And others will go, yeah, but, and I'll go, but, but what? I mean, that's like I said before, one of the one of the great strategies for getting people to come forth on stuff is when they say stupid things, just say, well, what do you mean? And when they say, well, you know, and I'll go, well, no, I don't know. <laughs> but but always saying it nicely because you want to disarm them. You do not want to incite them. Um, I've been teaching at the local jail for almost 20 years and the local jail is not a country club I deal with murderers and pickpockets and what you really learn is you don't want to piss them off and you disarm them and I don't mean it in a disingenuous way but you disarm them by being nice and I and, and I don't mean you're being nice in a gratuitous way you are being nice I mean the guys I've been teaching are human beings some of whom have done horrible things and they're trying to rehabilitate and they're going to be walking on the streets of Boulder and, and throughout the world. So you really want them to have social skills. <laughs> you, 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 I mean, you really don't want them to go back to the things that they used to do. And you could do the same thing with people who talk about speciesism. What do you, what do you mean um, that rats aren't as emotional as chimpanzees? Rats rescue other rats who are in pain. Mice read pain in the... The faces of other mice. Fishes will save one another. So anyway, I'm, I hope I'm making my point that it's total BS. Just it's it's just the worst of the worst. Okay, two more questions. Okay, perfect. So our next question, um, Andrea, I know I noted that you had your hand up. Do you still have a question that you'd like to ask? I'm not hearing anything. I think I think you're still on mute. Do you want to try unmuting? Uh, okay. Um. Hi, I'm a writer and. Oh, she, she's gone again. Oh, it went back on mute again. Riley's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep. Going back. Uh, I don't know why. Um, I'm a writer and I want to know what you, um, your view is about humane animal education and in terms of um, working with uh, juvenile offenders and um, 
I know there's some programs that um, uh, uh, do that um, throughout the country. And um, in terms of violence prevention, what's your what's your view on that? Where were you located? I'm I'm in Massachusetts. Oh, okay. Oh, I think it's the best. In Colorado, there are programs working, um, taking young kids who have some of whom are violently violent and putting them in programs where they work with horses who need help too. And there's a, a wonderful marriage. I, I don't think anybody's ever studied it. Uh, there's a place in, called Green Chimneys in Brewster, New York. Mm -hmm. And I've been there a number of times and they rescue animals, non-human and human. And they've noticed some phenomenon, I don't know how robust it is, where the humans gravitate to the non-humans who have had the same sort of abuse. I've seen it. it. It gives me chills to think about that. And you can ask some of the kids, why did you go to that horse or the donkey or the chicken or the rooster? And they'll say, oh, I just felt, um, I felt some kind of connection to them. And then you learn that they both had very similar types of abuse. I'm all for it. One of the programs in Colorado has been very successful because what you do is, Number one, the kids don't find the animals, uh, the non-human animals threatening. They bond with them immediately and, and they're responsible for the well-being of another being, which they've never had. I mean, I, I've seen some videos of horse. Um, there's a place in Boulder called Medicine Horse where I've given talks and you just see that you just see the connection that you, you you don't only see it, you feel it. It could bring you to tears because you see this bonding and these human kids have never had that. I mean, you know, and, and in my class at jail, they do award-winning art, they do award-winning writing. And when I, when I um, suggested teaching it years ago, the jail administrators, their minds were blown. They said, you want to do what? And I said, I want to talk about animals. I want to talk about how non-human animals resolve conflict. Um, the decision to do that had come up. I was chatting with Jane Goodall and she said, why don't you go teach at the jail? And I thought, well, I've wanted to. And I did. And so there's a Roots and Shoots program there. It's been active for almost 20 years. And guys get out. And I mean, some violent guys get out and they get jobs at humane societies, rescue centers, and their lives are changed. So I'm a fan of it. There's... Um, God, what is it called? Dogs. There's a there's a documentary, Dogs on the Inside. A chunk of it was filmed in Massachusetts. I'm sorry. You'll have to look at you. I don't if if you don't know it, you'll you'll find it online. And I was in it, and I got to talk to some of these people, and it's a very very successful program. But talking about younger kids, I worked with a gal who had had the most horrific upbringing. I mean, it just, it was shocking. She was alive at 16. Non-human animals and nature were her savior. And so when she would do drawing, she would draw trees and she would talk about trees and she, <clears throat> she was in love with trees. And I haven't seen her recently, but I know that when she finally got released, she went into some nature program um, and it was really successful. So I'm, I'm all for it. I mean, they're closely monitored, and and the I I, I don't know the data I don't know the, a global data set, but I can tell you that the data set I know shows the animals benefit too. That you know people go, oh look what they did to a human being, they'll do it to the animal. No. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. Yeah. So it it can teach compassion to people and to animals, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I I think so. I mean I. I mean, the animals I know who have been abused and have been taught have been um, rehabbed by kids who have been abused and who have gone on to do horrible things. It's it's a it's a win win situation. You know, people will always have exceptions. Well, what about this? What the hell with exceptions? I mean, there's exceptions to everything. If closely monitored, it works. And I'm a strong fan of it. And I know some kids around town who I see who are homeless 
And I would rather be their homeless dog than the dogs who I know live in some homes. I, I really don't mean that in any arrogant, facetious way. And you don't mess with their dogs. So I'm a, I'm a fan of it. Takes a lot of work, but I'm a total fan of it. So th thanks for your question. Thank you. Yeah. Look up dogs on the inside. It, I can't remember the facility in Massachusetts, but it'll be there. Great. Thanks. Okay. Another question. So our last question, um, I know that we have Adrian and Chelsea that have their hands up. They're both members of the anthrozoology group. So I will get them to get in touch with you after the event. But our last question of the night comes from the chat. It's from Mathilde. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, they say my microphone is not working right now and I am as good as speaking English as I am writing it. So I will write it here. I'm finishing my thesis in sociology about cockfighting in rural area in my country, Bolivia. Oh. I have made my field work as an undercover witness for more than three years. And now that I am finishing it, I ask myself, what should I do with the information I have? If I know, if I notice the police, although it is illegal, there's nothing they can do because it is too far. They told me that yeah. even if police would do something, it would be to intervene a cockfight and then take all the chickens to the slaughterhouse. As an individual, what would you do on my in my place? Do you, what do you think would be the best way to stop cockfighting? What do you think of cockfighting as tradition of the people like the cockers argue? Well, in the United States, not too long ago, two guys who tried to break up a cockfight in Ohio were assaulted, and one is he may still be in hospital with um, fractured skull. What, what, what Matilda in Bolivia, is that correct? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'll tell you the first thing I do is be really careful. And I don't mean that because you're a woman. I, I mean, these are two men in Ohio. I'd be really careful. I mean, I think the argument that it's part of culture for some people would really might weigh in. I, it doesn't for me at all. Okay. And I'm sure that there are more people who are parts of that culture who would agree that it should be banned right away. It's a violent activity. I mean, it really is. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what to suggest because of what recently happened and what I know has happened to people who have, um, men as well, who have um, publicly come out against dog fighting. A lot of the people involved in that are extremely uh, violent people. And so I don't mean it in any demeaning, any sort of, you know, way directed at a woman, but I would be really careful. And if you were a man, I would say the same thing. I'd be really, really careful. Um, I do know people who have done undercover work on different sorts of dog fighting, and they've retained their anonymity, and they've put the information out there. You know, it's like a lot of animal abuse. Most people don't even know about it. They just don't they just don't know about it. And Gretchen Weiler, an old former activist who passed away a few years ago, used to say cruelty can't stand the spotlight. She was 100 percent on. So what I encourage people to do is go to the media, go to newspapers, radio stations, TV stations in Bolivia, for example. And I don't know that there's a good way to guarantee anonymity. I'm not saying that they're going to violate an agreement, but it's with social media and stuff like that, it's hard. It really is. So I've encouraged a few people to create false names, <laughs> create false email addresses, because a lot of places in the media will ask for names and email addresses um, and, and, you know, to verify that there's a human being on the end of this um, message. But I think the sad fact about cockfighting and dog fighting and other sorts of abuse is that there's a lot of ret retribution out there. It just is, it's not, not because you're in Bolivia, you could be anywhere, you could be in Ohio, in America. And, um, and I know a, num a good number of people, men and women, who have, been threatened in ways that I wouldn't want to be threatened because their identities became known. So I think that remaining 
if it were me, remaining anonymous would be the key factor in who I contacted and what I put out there. And there's 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 ways to do it. A, a, a friend of mine who's a tech freak. I mean, she's you know, I always she could she could hack anything, which is scary. Um, you know, will tell me that there's ways to maintain your anonymity out there. You know, um, you can v use VPN instead of so that your IP address is hidden. I know it sounds like I'm writing something for the CIA or the FBI, but but I think it's that serious um, for men and women that you put this information out. You're dealing with people who have no just no regard for the sanctity of life. So, uh, Matilda, I hope I answered your question. Um, the only other thing I can think about is I don't know. I know that there are some animal protection um, uh, organizations in um, in Bol Bolivia. I, I worked with one years ago. I, I, I can't remember the name of it at all, but maybe working with them because they too would be very big fans of retaining um, anonymity. So if there's a positive question, I always have to end these things on something positive. So if someone has some question um, that can, um, yeah, before I go get a beer, <laughs> um, if somebody has a, has a, has a something positive, then that would be great. For sure. Uh, Chelsea and Adrian both had their hands up. Do you guys happen to have a positive question that we can end on? Okay, I'm just I'm gonna see first and then Adrian if you want to say oh I can top that then you just jump in. <laughs> um, all right, I wrote my question down so I'm just uh, gonna go to it. Um, so I am in the anthrozoology club. I go to Windsor University and I'm taking anthrozoology and a few other courses and there's a course that we must end on called the capstone and we can kind of design it. And I know that a lot of students want to go and volunteer across the world and work with animals for any kind, exotic, marine, whatever. And uh, when volunteering at a wildlife conservation across the world, what questions should you ask to avoid um, fake conservations that are money gimmicks for tourists that actually exploit animals towards the end of it? Like, you, I know you can't come straight out and ask but how do you how do you kind of do proper research into that you know it's hard to do because a lot of them just lie so um i i'm i'm not really sure i mean it depends on the organization i mean some of the organizations that i work with like animals asia in china i work closely with them and i know jill robinson their ceo and founder they are one thousand percent above board there's an all Africa animal welfare network and I've worked closely with them on the ground in Kenya as well. They are they are 1000 percent above board. I think the question you're asking is not only going abroad, but asking about organizations in Canada and the United States, because like I said, I mean, defenders of wildlife in the United States, they may do some good things, but they refuse to come out against killing wolves. I mean, they just do. So. You know, that's an individual decision one can make. I would choose not to support them because I don't want wolves being killed. Um, you could ask people who have worked for the, these organizations as well. So um, depending on what your interests are, the Blue Cross um, Animal Protection Organization, I don't know the formal name, but it's called Blue Cross in India, does remarkably good work, a lot focused on um, dogs because there were so many stray free-ranging dogs in India. Um, but I think, I, I, I don't know because I don't know what kind of information there is online. So I always like to go to people, like if somebody asks me about a particular organization, what the first thing I'll do is try to think about somebody who has worked with them or, or like in China, just going to Jill and other people at organizations um, that I know well and asking them what they think about them. There's there, uh, nothing beats on the ground information. I mean, it, ju it just doesn't. 
And and while I'm at it, I'll tell you that if you're interested in stuff like that, um, I just reviewed this book for Psych Today. It's called Animal Welfare in China by Peter Lee. And I've worked with Peter on the ground in China. And the reason I recommend it is because he covers a lot of what's happening in China. And I'm sure there are other books for other countries where you can get that information. So I hope that answers your question. But it's it's tricky even in the United States. It's tricky in Canada. You know, anybody can call themselves an animal welfareist and then say, well, I care about the welfare of animals, but I allow them to be killed or tortured in labs or kept in zoos and shipped around as if they're, you know, sperm or egg machines. I mean, they, they just do. And so you, I guess the bumper sticker here would be do your homework. <laughs> I mean, I really, really mean that. I. I guess I've been doing this long enough that my shock level might not be as high as you because you're also young. But today, literally, my shock level was almost obliterated by discovering some of the activities that some organizations support. So it's yeah, I I, I don't. I, that's a positive message. It's not a negative message because your question is positive. Because I'm, I'm an optimist, so I'm always cashing things out positively that it's positive that somebody might want to go around the world and do something. It's great to hear from people in Mexico and Bolivia. I mean, it, it, it is I, this talk that I did with these Chilean um, law students in Santiago, Chile, just it made my day. I mean, it, it really did. Not because I don't think that there's going to be people like that, but it made my day because I know that globally there's... There's some organizations in Pakistan that are doing amazing work. Um, there's organizations in India that are doing amazing work. And if you think it's hard doing stuff in Canada or the good old United States, try doing it there. I mean, when I go to China, it, I, I can't even put in words how it blows my mind what they get done in, in, in situations that are not user friendly. This is not condemning China. China's reputation is completely misblown in terms of animal, you know, you, you read about the bad stuff, for example, but, but um, in, in the atmosphere in which they're working. So, voila. <laughs> well, I think that about does that. Um, it's great. Thank, thank you. you so much, Dr. Yeah. Beckhoff, for, for coming and joining us tonight and for staying a little bit extra. That it really means a lot. And to everyone that came, had questions and participated, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think that about does it. Um, I hope everyone has a good night and that you all stay safe. And yeah, thank you so much. But don't forget what I just said. You're the future. <laughs> I don't, I, don't, I don't mean to burden you, <laughs> but 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 you are you you really are. Things are going to get better, but you, you but you really are the future. D just don't give up. I mean, you know, everything you say counts, and and I, I you know I'm not parroting Jane Goodall, but I really do I do totally subscribe to you know her a, a number of things, but the one you know that every individual matters and. The flip side of that is not that you all matter, oh, not only that you all matter, but it, the life of every individual counts. And that's and that gets back to what we were talking about. So thank you. Good luck. If you have questions, you can email me. And not to burden you, but I'm expecting wonderful things from you all. <laughs> just... Well, we have amazing people like you to look up to. So <laughs> it's just great. <laughs> Well, good luck with it. If you got any questions, pop me an email. And I run this Animal Cognition, Emotions, and Conservation Group. If you want your name added to it, just send me an email with, with a legit email address. Um, there's people who try to get on it who are trying to undermine it. They, people do that. But I'll be more than happy to add you to the, lit, to the group. And if it gets too much, hit the D button. That's what the D button is for on your computer. Um, but thank you all for having me and thank you, Riley, for organizing this. It's really such as my heart and um, good luck to you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckoff. Thank Great. you. Take care. Have a good evening. It's Take late care. there. Okay. Thank you very much. You bet. My pleasure. Riley.